Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of Do I Have Time For This? The series that looks at old and new video games, both indie and AAA, to help you figure out whether or not you have the time to actually play it, finish it, 100% complete it, or just leave it in your backlog to forever gather dust. We're all busy in life, jobs, kids, classes, exercising, you name it. So let's take a little time right now to look at Bramble the Mountain King and figure out, do I have time for this? Today we're looking at Bramble the Mountain King, a cinematic third-person horror game based on dark Nordic fables by developer Dimfrost Studio and published by Merge Games. Starting in the night when Ole wakes and finds his sister Lillimore missing, the story of Bramble starts out with you trying to find your lost sibling, but ends with you solving the problems of a chain of events set in motion decades ago. Bramble follows the same structure as many third-person story-based horror games, each area has its own unique vibe, with a small smattering of puzzles and platforming until you move to the main meat of any of these types of games, the Pursuers. The narrative here is mainly provided through exposition from a literal narrator. Each section contains a small child storybook which provides a bit of backstory about the pursuer you are facing off against, and honestly these small fables are some of the most grim and disturbing stories I've ever heard. There is some visual storytelling and world building you could find, but often this is laid out for you moments later by a storybook, which kind of takes the fun of speculating lore away from you, as good as the storybooks are. Essentially, Ole's quest is about making sure he's not alone, that he doesn't fail his sister, and that love can overcome even insurmountable obstacles. The game's story really focuses on his inaction, and tries to develop this a bit throughout, but never really hits home in terms of full character development. This is a fairy tale game, with a very dark heart at the centre. If you've played any of these types of almost walking simulator style horror games before, you know what gameplay to expect here. You are set on a linear path with a singular objective to achieve, and whilst you can stop and sniff the roses, besides the odd collectible or storybook, there's never a huge draw to going off the beaten path like bespoke jump scares or a hidden path you can find. Platforming is fairly rudimentary here, and frankly a little floaty, allowing you to jump with a little bit of forgiveness on long distances and give you a few climbable surfaces, but for the most part the path is incredibly obvious and easy to traverse. That being said, there were a few times where I jumped towards a climbable surface just for the game to shout NOPE and let me just fall to my death, which for a certain achievement was very frustrating. Puzzles are for the most part fairly bare bones to begin with, there are a few more complicated ones a bit further on, but honestly if you've ever played a game with any of these kinds of puzzles, you'll more than easily get through this game with zero issues. Checkpointing is very generous, allowing you to die halfway through a section and not have to replay an entire gameplay segment just because you hit jump when you should have ducked for example, and believe me, the amount you'll die on a first playthrough, you'll be thankful for this generous checkpointing. As with any horror game of this design, you die in one hit. Now, it's really personal preference if you can deal with this, get seen in your dead mentality, but it really isn't for everyone. The idea behind these types of horror games, and really a flaw in my mind of them, is that by their own design, the insta-fail state means there's not really any room for innovation here. You're expected to get through X set piece by performing X actions in that way and no other. If you accidentally sprint when you should have crouch walk, well that's game over for you. Stop! He's already dead! This can become increasingly frustrating when you are going through one part over and over again trying to figure out what it is exactly you're supposed to do, However, with the generous checkpointing and the fairly straightforward level layout, this luckily doesn't happen often. It was worrying that I managed to come across two different duplicate set pieces in a 4 hour game. I would have accepted it in a slightly longer game, but here with playing it in one sitting, I couldn't help but notice it. I found that to be two hide in cover from the shockwave style set pieces and two run from the monster under the water type sequences, which in such a small game, I was really disappointed to see. That being said, for what Bramble lacked in terms of set-piece creativity, they did add something completely new to this type of horror game. Proper boss fights. This innovation mainly comes from the light ball you pick up at the start of your quest to save your sister, that acts as your light source throughout the game. Later on, this ball can be fired at enemies during specific boss fights with certain pursuer enemies, and honestly, the boss designs and attacks are actually really inspired. 
It is somewhat shackled by the limited movement options, but Dim Frost Studio managed to really make something innovative that genuinely felt like not only a breath of fresh air after familiar stealth and running sections, but also something that fit the game to stand off against a boss that in some cases completely fills the screen. And just to mention, without spoiling anything, the scale of the final boss fight alongside the music makes for an insane and memorable ending. They definitely save the best for last. Graphically speaking, Bramble the Mountain King is one of the most beautiful indie games that I've ever played. Speaking purely from an environmental and world design perspective, alongside some of the creatures and wildlife, this game looks incredible. Although I do think Ole's face has a lot of room for improvement. Bramble absolutely nails the initial whimsy of falling into a fairy tale world with verdant greens and a crazy high level of particle effects on screen in certain parts, with each animal, flower and mushroom really looking like it belongs in a storybook. This story, however, isn't just rainbows and riding hedgehogs though. The game has some truly disgusting creatures, like the trolls in the opening act, or Nacken, the evil fiddler demon from the demo they released a while back. These depraved creatures drip with saliva when they're chasing you, blood oozes from carcasses, and the deaths Ole receives are quick and very graphic. As the game goes on, it gets progressively darker in tone. Soon you will entirely forget the frogs and the little pinecone people, only for them to be replaced with corpses and demons. At this stage of the video, I really want to bring up some serious subject matter you will be exposed to in Bramble the Mountain King. So, this is the warning you get before the game reaches the main menu. Now I've played almost every mainstream horror game you can think of, and even I was surprised at how dark a certain chapter of this game gets. Featuring a midwife type ghoul in a swamp, the idea of this section is that women have been performing a ritual in the swamp in order to become a witch in a pact with the devil. Whilst navigating the swamp, the wannabe witch's hut, and fighting the midwife boss with some of the spookiest and engaging gameplay of Bramble, it cannot be said enough that this game gets extremely dark here. If you are at all sensitive to the topics of suicide or infanticide, I would steer clear of this specific section. I legitimately think that the developers need an option to skip the ending section of this level, seriously. It adds nothing of value to the gameplay and is only mentioned in passing as some motivation for Ole near the end of the game, so I feel giving the people the option to bypass the 5 minutes or so where these two things occur would only be beneficial. Also worth noting, there is an achievement in this part of the game which I find to be a little bit in poor taste. Once this section has concluded, the game really picks up and changes perspective, which I find often fluctuates throughout the game. Originally you start as a miniature boy running from the trolls and away from pursuers, but then you reach another area where you seem to be a normal boy's height with everything fitting you to scale. I'm not sure if this was an oversight by Dimfrost and the sections were built without considering the continuity, but it is a little odd to look around and see your normal height without it being referenced or anything like that. So let's get down to it. How long does this game take? If you're looking to do just the main story, no achievements, and having setbacks, you'll be looking at around three and a half hours. If you decide you're going to get all of the achievements and collectibles, you can easily push this to around six to eight hours, depending on whether or not you followed a guide and went for the hardest achievement at the same time as finishing the first run through. Personally, I would recommend just doing a normal playthrough of the game first, then do a second run afterwards to finish any achievements you missed, as really the idea behind these lore-driven, atmospheric horror games is to take your time and really drink in the world. I played through this game and completed it with almost all the achievements, bar the hardest one, with 4.8 hours on record. This was whilst on stream, so was taking my time with me clocking in 9 hours after finishing the game again, and with getting footage for this video. This game also has a very good chapter select function, allowing you to jump in and get any achievements you might have missed throughout your first playthrough in a matter of minutes. I can only say, in this regard, Bramble very much respects your time. What is the hardest achievement I keep talking about? Well, much like with one of the inspirations for this game, Limbo, you need to finish the game without dying or restarting at a checkpoint. This means not only do you need to know what to do for every section, but you can't restart if you get seen you need to start the whole game over again. Of course, whether or not you save scum this, or decide to be a purist and complete it legitimately, the fact you need to know what's coming and where to go the entire time really ruins a first playthrough of a horror game, which is why I recommended you played through it before trying out for this achievement. I don't often dwell on cost for games as being a good metric of whether or not it's worth getting, whether or not it's worth picking up, 
but Bramble the Mountain King's price point really does match the amount of time you spend in the game here. Something that doesn't overstay its welcome for a lower price point is honestly fine by me. It is worth pointing out again though, some of the set pieces were repeated in a fairly short experience. So if you get sick of repeating the same things over and over again, might be something to take on board before you pick up this game. Again, like I always point out where possible, there is actually a free demo available on Steam. If you want a better sense of the vibe and tone on offer, the section you play honestly isn't the strongest available, and I would have personally went for the troll section at the start of the game that displays a light taste of the boss fights you can experience in Bramble, but if you finish the demo and aren't drawn in by the world and graphics, I don't think this game will be for you. Ultimately, whether or not Bramble the Mountain King is for you depends solely on your taste as a horror game fan. Can you deal with instant death scenarios? Can you deal with very dark subject matter presented to you as the game goes on? Are you happy with light platforming and puzzle elements? Are you just here for a dark fairy tale story based on Nordic mythology? If you can deal with the trappings of your average third person horror game, you will definitely be satisfied with what Bramble has to offer. The deep lore and disgusting creature design really does build a dark fairy tale world you can't help but want to know more about, even if you might find something a little darker than you'd like. I personally recommend Bramble to fans of horror games who've always wanted a little bit more than walk from A to B, as the introduction of the big set piece boss fights genuinely feels like a new take on a tired formula of run and hide, and offer a spectacle befitting a fairy tale story. With full completion being a max of 8 hours, plentiful checkpoints and a large respect to both the player's time and wallet, I think there's a nice little story here wrapped in something grisly. Those with limited time can easily dip in and out here, and if you only have one night free a week to game, you can actually finish this game from beginning to end in one go, even with a snack break. This is one of those rare times where I'd say if you like the sound of everything I've said before, I'd say complete it. It won't be a waste of your time, despite a few shortcomings of the genre itself. So, do you think you have time for Bramble the Mountain King? On this channel I like to give my thoughts on the game, alongside a bit more of a deep dive on the time you have to invest, so you know what you're getting into before you load it up, because time is precious, right? If you enjoyed the video or found it useful, feel free to like and share. If you subscribe, I'm looking to put out regular content like this, alongside some more in-depth video essays, so stick around, and if you have any requests on future videos, just drop them in the comments. And finally, if you want to come hang out and chat with me, you can find me over on twitch.tv slash graciousrhino every Sunday. I'm Gracious Rhino, look after each other, and I'll catch you soon.